Living Corporate is brought to you by The Access Point. The reality is, this is the largest influx of black and brown talent corporate America has ever had. And as a result, a variety of talent entering the workforce are first generation professionals. The other reality, most of these folks aren't learning what it means to navigate a majority white workplace in their college classes. Enter The Access Point a live weekly web show within the Living Corporate Network that gives black and brown college students the real talk they need and likely haven't heard elsewhere. Every week, our hosts and special guests are dropping gems, so don't miss out. Check out The Access Point, airing every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Central Standard on livingcorporate.tv. Hey everybody, this is See It To Be It, the Saturday podcast from Living Corporate. Living Corporate is a digital media network that centers and amplifies black and brown people at work. My name is Amy C. Wanninger, and I'm the host of See It To Be It. When I was growing up in rural Southern Indiana, I didn't know people who went to college or who worked in professional roles. I didn't know what those jobs looked like or how to break into them. But this show isn't about me, it's about our guests. Every Saturday, I bring you career stories from everyday role models in jobs you may not know exist. More importantly, the folks I interview share their perspectives as black and brown professionals in jobs and environments where they may be the only. My guest today is Angela V. Harris, who is a technologist. She works at Microsoft, but she's also a philanthropist. And I can't wait for you to hear our interview. But before we get to that, we're going to tap in with Tristan for some career advice. What's going on, Living Corporate? It's Tristan of Layfield Resume Consulting, and I'm back to bring you another career tip. This week, I want to talk to you about why your LinkedIn profile alone won't get recruiters or hiring managers in your inbox. You tried to utilize LinkedIn to land your next role, but it hasn't been working for you, and you don't know why. You heard that LinkedIn was the place to be for job seekers. You've also heard the stories of people landing jobs through the platform. So you updated your profile pic, copy and pasted your summary and job descriptions from your resume, added your education, and boom, you have an all-star profile, which LinkedIn states can get you up to 27 times more views. You then take some time to connect with quite a few people, and you sign off. A couple days pass, and then those days turn into weeks, and you finally decide to sign back in. But you've got nothing but maybe a few connection requests from people you may or may not know. You start thinking, what is all the hype about? Why am I not getting any jobs? Well, the problem is you're not using LinkedIn correctly. You aren't liking, commenting, sharing, and posting on the platform, yet you want to be seen. See the disconnect? LinkedIn's algorithm prioritizes engagement, not profile completion. That 27 times more views only applies to people who actively post on LinkedIn. Think about it. When you get on the platform and you start to scroll, you typically will see posts from the same people. Why is that? That's because these people know that LinkedIn rewards value-based engagement. And what do I mean by that? I mean insightful posts, not just dropping an article without commenting. I mean taking the time to comment on others' posts to add value and spark conversation, not just commenting great article. I mean sharing other people's posts and adding insight. I mean writing articles to share your work, lessons, and takeaways that position you as a thought leader. Most people will tell me, well, I don't know what to post, or I'm scared because my boss or potential employers are on the platform. But let me tell you something. You not putting yourself out there is the exact reason that potential employers can't find you on the platform. Learn how to take what you do in your day-to-day work and incorporate it into the platform. This does one of two things. First, it keeps the process of identifying content from becoming too burdensome. Second, it also keeps your messaging on brand or on topic. The next thing you want to do is to consider how often and in what ways you're engaging with other people's content. Remember, LinkedIn is all about developing organic relationships, but you can't do that if you aren't interacting with other people's content. 
If any of what I described resonated with you and you are looking for a coherent strategy on how to unlock the power of LinkedIn, I invite you to utilize the link in the show notes to book a suitability call with me for my new career level up coaching program. This tip was brought to you by Tristan of Layfield Resume Consulting. Check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Layfield Resume or connect with me, Tristan Layfield, on LinkedIn. Living Corporate is brought to you by The Leadership Range, a podcast within the Living Corporate Network. Hosted by globally certified and Fortune 500 executive coach and leadership development expert Neil Edwards, The Leadership Range is focused on having real, raw, soulful, and accountable conversations about inclusive leadership, allyship, professional development. Every week is a new episode with new learning and new actions to take on to grow inclusively. Make sure you check out The Leadership Range everywhere you listen to podcasts. Welcome back to See It To Be It. My guest today is Angela V. Harris. Angela is an innovative leader and change agent with over 20 years of experience as an IT professional in the healthcare, insurance, and technology industries. She's currently a senior product marketing manager at Microsoft in Redmond, Washington. Her superpower is helping individuals maximize their strengths to stand out and to achieve greatness. She lives by Gandhi's famous words, be the change you wish to see in the world. You can learn more about Angela at www.angelavharris.com. And you can learn a lot more about her by staying tuned as we welcome her to the show. Hi, Angela. Hi, Amy. Thank you so much for having me. I am so thrilled to have you here. So you and I met just very recently and I loved your story and asked you to come on the show. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Can I ask you a little bit about how you got into technology? Sure. Well, I guess you could say I'm kind of like a seasoned, you know, technology vet at this point. And I know today there's so many, you know, girls and STEM and, you know, girls coding initiatives. But when I was a child, those initiatives didn't exist. So for me, it simply was me seeing a computer. I remember I was in a store with my aunt on a Saturday afternoon and we were walking through the electronic section. And I don't even know if, it, if I knew it was a computer at the time, but I just knew I was fascinated by it. And I was just camped out, you know, playing around, you know, typing away on the keys, like not knowing what I was doing. And fast forward, my father must have picked up on something just because when I was nine years old, he purchased my first computer for me. It was a Commodore 64C. And I know a lot of people will ask, you know, well, who was your STEM icon or your STEM role model? And honestly, like I said, STEM wasn't even an acronym when I was a child. I think the STEM acronym was invented like, you know, late 90s. So for me, if I had to pick a STEM role model, I would say it was my father because, you know, he was the first person to see something in me and believe in me. And it was him purchasing that computer for me when I was nine. And, you know, I was just like that, that nerdy girl. So I would come home after school. My, my friends were playing like Sega and Nintendo video games, but I was the one like teaching myself how to do things on my computer. So that was just my entrance into technology. I was always fascinated by computers and always doing something on my computer. And I knew that I always wanted to attend college. And because I always had a computer, I just knew I wanted to study something computer related. And I just made that my goal. That's great. And when you say Commodore 64, all these memories come flooding yes, back to school, me. Yes, old school, old school. <laughs> <laughs> of, of, um, my favorite memory though, because my dad was very into computers and my favorite memory of the Commodore 64 that was in our spare bedroom at our house was we had a tape drive. Do you remember those? Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Cassette tape, right? That you, you put it in. It looked just like a, it looked like one of the old um, answering machine tapes, right? You'd put that in there and you plug it into the computer with one of the serial port cables. And that's how you loaded the software back in the day, right? Because you couldn't download it from the internet. There was no internet. And I remember my dad there was saying, dial up. there wasn't like the internet that we know now there was the dial up. Well, internet. that was later though. Okay. Right. Cause like right. at first we didn't have the modem and you had to actually put your phone in the thing. Remember that okay. you had to put your phone in the modem to make it and it would use the sounds to anyway, I remember my dad putting, you know, he's, he, we had this really cool, um, Ghostbusters game. Did you ever play oh, that I, on your Commodore? No, but Ghostbusters is actually one of my favorite movies. <laughs> So it was really cool because you got to pimp out your ghost mobile. Like you'd go to, you'd go on runs and capture ghosts and make money. And oh then you gosh. got to add like really cool stuff to your ghost mobile. Oh my God. And that was I kind of the it. point. of <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, so we had the ghost mobile, you know, the Ghostbusters game on a tape 
and he put it in there of course you'd press play and wait and wait and wait and I remember him telling me one time he said they make these things they're they're square they're about this big and he held up his fingers you know Mm -hmm. uh, about five inches apart right here they're about this big it's called a floppy disk and all the tape that's on that tape drive is instead of a, a tape that goes from reel to reel it's a flat disk and it spins really fast and if we could afford a floppy drive our games would load like that you remember those days? <laughs> uh, yeah, I had a so I had the floppy. Was it the five and a half? And then I yeah. got upgraded to the three and a quarter. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> but I love that. No, it's like my kids are like, Mom, the internet's slow. I'm like, really? Because we're you all streaming slow. All you streaming slow. movies. <laughs> if you don't know slow. <laughs> Talk about dial up. <laughs> <laughs> Still hear that crunching noise in my head when anybody mentions dial up. So, okay. So you started with your Commodore. What kind of stuff were you doing on that thing? Um, playing games and this was like in the early days like you know bulletin board services so again having that dial up modem and it's like dial it into different bulletin board services and having chats with people and I remember um, a lot of people know AOL but I feel like the predecessor to AOL was this internet service called Prodigy so I had Prodigy so that was like my first internet service provider so I would do things on Prodigy and eventually I taught myself how to do like the basic programming language so I taught myself how to program in basic and taught myself how to type on my computer. That yeah. is awesome. That is awesome. So when you went to college, then what did you major in? I majored in computer science. Well, I started as a computer science major. And I'll say because again, we didn't have, I didn't have STEM role models. So at that time, you know, computer science was like the thing to do if you wanted, to, if you wanted a career in technology. And honestly, when I applied to college, I was kind of on the fence about information systems as well. But I said, you know, computer science is like what I always thought I would do. And at the time, um, I, I attended Drexel University, which is a five-year cooperative education university. And they, they had a five-year bachelor's, master's program in computer science. And I figured, you know, I, I was already going to be going to school for five years anyway, because we also do co-ops, which adds on a year to your program of study. So if I'm going to school for five years anyway, why not graduate with my bachelor's and my master's? However, I was ill-prepared for computer science. My basic programming did not prepare me for introductory C++, and I struggled in my computer science classes. I, you know, went to office hours. I, you know, met with my professors, but, you know, I just really couldn't grasp, you know, C++ programming. So I struggled in my classes. My GPA also suffered as well, and I made the decision that information systems was a better fit for me. So I ended up changing my major to information systems my sophomore year, and I loved it because honestly, when I was looking at my my course of study for computer science, like the next four years, it was like, you know, program in this language and programming in that language. And it just wasn't exciting to me, but information systems is kind of like a, a best of both worlds. It's like a blend of the technology and the business aspect. And it basically helps, you know, identify technology solutions for people. So you're integrating people and technology. And that that was just a better route for me. Yeah, I think it's important that people understand that there's more than one way to get where you want to go. Yes, yes. And so when you got into the information systems classes, that appealed to you more. Is that what you eventually got? Did you get both degrees? In no, I got my degree, my undergraduate degree is in information systems. Okay, excellent. And so then you weren't at Microsoft like right out of college, right? You kind of I was bounced not, around. No, so talk I, about no, that my, journey. I started my early career in Philadelphia. And again, it was interesting. Um, You know, college graduate, you, you have like these, these high expectations. I'm going to, you know, enter the job force, I hit the ground running. And I graduated from Drexel in 2002. And I remember at the start of my senior year, they had like this, you know, big meeting with the seniors. Like, yeah, we have some really bad news for you. The, the job market is really bad this year. And, you know, on-campus recruiting has been cut Um dramatically and it's going to be harder to you know find a job and again I had that bad freshman year from computer science so my GPA wasn't the greatest and you know that um, held me back from applying to certain jobs through our on-campus recruiting because a lot of companies they won't even look at your resume unless you have you know a 3.0 or higher GPA and unfortunately you know I finished college with a 2.95 GPA so I couldn't apply to like the Lockheed Martins or some of the larger companies that I thought that I envisioned for myself, you know, as a college graduate. And that, that was, that was really, that was really hurtful for me. You know, I feel like, you know, I worked so hard to graduate. I've overcome so many things. And also, you know, my father passed away when I was in college too, my, my senior year of college and my father died, but I was still able to graduate and, you know, graduate a term early. So I overcame so many things. And 
to not be able to have the job or the career that I envisioned after I graduated it was kind of a hard pill to swallow. And my first job was actually not the job that I envisioned. I started out working on a help desk and I took the job, you know, to kind of get my foot in the door with the expectations of, you know, moving over into another department, because at the time I was interested in, you know, network engineering and I had done co-ops in the network engineering space. So, you know, I said, let me take this opportunity, you know, to get my foot in the door and then, you know, do like an internal transfer. And that didn't work out in my favor either because the company eventually went into a hiring freeze. So that, that wasn't even an option. And then on top of that, I just had a really bad experience with that company. I remember about two weeks in, two or three weeks into the company, there was, um, there was me and another girl that we were hired to work on the help desk. And I remember that our manager, you know, pulled us to the side and he was, you know, giving us this talk about, you know, there's this really important job in the company that oftentimes goes overlooked. And what I didn't realize was that he was basically setting us up to say that we were going to have to backfill for the receptionist. The receptionist was also in his organization and that if she needed to, you know, go to lunch or she was going to be out of the office, we would essentially have to be the backup receptionist. And I'm just thinking, you know, I spent five years at Drexel, overcame a lot to get my degree and worked very hard to get my degree. I didn't graduate from college to work as a receptionist. I don't have no disrespect for people that serve in that capacity, but that just wasn't my my plan for the plan of the vision for my life. And that was another hard pill to swallow, having, you know, worked so hard to get to this point. And basically I'm told that, you know, I have to do a job that I wasn't hired to do. And then to make, make matters even worse, we eventually got a mail on our team. And again, I was told that this was something that we would rotate amongst the team. And when my manager saw that I, I was training the male on our team to do that work, he, he pulled me to the side and said, oh, he doesn't have to do that because he doesn't fit the image that I want to portray. So mm. I got out of there as soon as I could, because again, it's, I, I, that just wasn't my career path. And I felt that if I stayed at that company, my career was just not going to advance. So just got out of there and, you know, moved to another opportunity and, you know, just kind of moved around different companies within the Philadelphia area and eventually landed at Microsoft. And what brought me to Microsoft, I happened to be in a leadership development program 2018 and the 2019 and was a program called Emerge Academy sponsored by the Information Technology senior management forum specifically for women of color in the tech industry. And the mission of ITSMF is to increase representation of black professionals at senior levels of technology. And there was a woman in my cohort that, you know, worked at Microsoft and she just happened to share in our Slack channel one day that, hey, you know, if you know anyone that's looking for new, new opportunities, there's an opening in my department. So I said, hey, you know, I want to learn more. So, you know, we had an informational interview and she passed my resume along to one of her colleagues and the rest is history. That's fantastic. And what I love about that story is you were in this program, right? And the program gave you access to people yes. who could get you where you wanted to go. And that's, yes. that's how things happen. I don't know that people, people who haven't worked in corporate spaces for very long often don't realize that it's those chance connections a lot of times or those cultivated relationships that get you where you need to be. It's not, you know, submitting your application online necessarily. Oh, no, no. Yeah, you bring up a great point. Actually, I just did a webinar last week for, for Drexel University. And, you know, 80% of jobs are landed through networking. And um, with the applicant tracking systems, like 75% of your, your applications aren't even making it to the hiring manager's desk. And if you really want to, you know, aspire to your know, leadership positions, that number just keeps shrinking. So it's really about, you know, networking and who you know. Yeah. You know, it occurs to me as you were talking about, you know, your GPA being a 2.95, which is nothing to be ashamed of at all, right? I mean, that's that's a very respectable GPA. And then you look at what you went through to get that, right? To get to mm -hmm. that point. I, just, I want to put a, a point on this because, you know, there might be people who are listening who are doing college recruiting right now to just keep in mind, there's no equity in the GPA system. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. And, and I feel like, you know, you, you bring up a good point. You say there is no shame, but I remember my freshman year, again, I had that, you know, didn't, wasn't doing well in my computer science classes. And, you know, I finished, I finished fourth in my, in my high school class. So like, I was always a good student and, you know, to get, you know, C's, like it was, that was like a, a huge blow to me. But I remember I actually went to um, a conference my freshman year and I went to the career fair, just, you know, trying to explore opportunities. And I can't remember what company it was, but, you know, I went up to the booth, you know, introduced myself, had my resume in hand. And when the recruiter found out my GPA, which was below a 3.0, she gave my resume back to me. 
and that experience just like just really it crushed me yeah I'm so sorry that happened to you yeah um a friend of mine used as her example one time in an interview they asked her what she was most proud of and she said she was most proud of her college GPA and it was like in the 27530 range Mm -hmm. right you know, and the response was, well, why on earth would you be proud of that? And her story was similar to yours, right? She said, well, I, you know, I lost my mother, my junior year of high school. I had to work to pay my way through school. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had, yeah. you know, I got a terminal illness or a chronic illness diagnosis, you know, in the middle of all of that. Mm-hmm. I had this thing happen and this thing happened and this thing happened. And I finished my degree on time. Yeah. Yeah. And it yeah. changed the narrative completely. That's true. That's true. Yeah, like I said, in my case, like I was very fortunate. I even finished a term early, despite, you know, everything that happened. I even graduated one term early. And you also bring up another point. I remember we just had the the mission to Mars and there was like this um, social media post about, uh, I guess, like one of the engineers and they were saying they had like a 2.4, but like now that they're working at NASA and they contributed to the Mars, you know, the Mars exposition. Yeah, it's, and it's funny because after that first, like round of interviews out of college. Nobody ever asks you your GPA again. And so it's just such a ridiculous um, and arbitrary hurdle to make people clear. It is, it is. And honestly, like, you know, I remember in college, I remember like the students that had, you know, the high GPAs, they were sometimes, you know, cheating or like finding ways to beat the system to get those GPAs, to get those opportunities that, you know, when they're, you know, on those jobs, like they're slacking off. They're not performing. They don't have the work ethic that somebody with a lower GPA may have because everyone has a story. And I feel like you have to understand the story. You can't just base it off of a GPA and think, oh, like they're an underachiever or, or they're not they're not intelligent. Everyone has a story and you just have to, mm-hmm. you know, look at their story and just get to know people. Definitely. And, you know, the, the course load is another thing, right? If somebody takes a really high course load, with really hard courses, it's, mm-hmm. there's, a, it's a different, right. There's no diving score on that, right. on that, right. Where it's like, oh, you took a harder course. So it counts for more. Doesn't work that way. But you mentioned that you are still working um, directly with Drexel. Um, I know you've done, you've done some content with them. You've done mm-hmm. some education there, but you're actually involved in some philanthropy with Drexel as well. Could you talk about that? Yeah, sure. And I guess I, I, I never thought I would be, you know, a philanthropist or a donor, but in 2017, I took a plunge and I used $5,000 of my own money to start a scholarship at Drexel. And I, I mentioned that, you know, my father passed away my senior year in college. And up until that time, he was using his retirement savings to pay for my education. I got a small grant from Drexel, but it didn't cover my, you know, tuition and I didn't get any scholarships. I know today, there's, you know, a lot of scholarship opportunities for, you know, women studying technology. But when I was a student, those things did not exist. Or if they did, I I was probably excluded because of my GPA. And I remember, you know, after my father died, I I called financial aid office and said, you know, know, both my parents are now deceased because my mother, my mother also passed when I was three years old. And, you know, my father was now deceased. And I remember the person saying that the only support that I could get was a loan. And I just didn't feel comfortable because I was not working. You know, I was, I'd been working part-time for my co-op employer, but I was literally laid off my first day back to work after my father's funeral. So I had no job. And like I said, my father was deceased and they're telling me like, well, we can give you a loan. And again, I already knew that they were saying that the job market wasn't going to be the greatest. So I just didn't feel comfortable taking on a loan, not knowing what the future was holding, if I would be able to, you know, pay that loan back. And Thankfully, my father was a steward of his money. We weren't, he, we were not millionaires, but he was a steward of his money. And there was, you know, money available for me to pay my education. And that experience is what kind of motivated me to want to help a student in the future, because I would never want a student to hear those words. There's nothing we can do. And I, I realized that I'm very fortunate that I did not have to leave school and that I was able to, to finish my degree and graduate. And I wanted to be able to provide that same opportunity for other people. And honestly, I never knew what went into starting a scholarship. I just simply asked the question to someone, you know, how does someone start a scholarship? Because a lot of times you only hear about the billionaires like the Bill and Melinda Gates or the McKenzie Mosses who are making billion and million dollar donations to universities. And it just seems unattainable for the average person. And I asked the question and at Drexel, they have something called a current youth scholarship. And there's two funding levels. You can fund it at $2,500 or $5,000. And in my case, I knew that I wanted my, my um, money to support an African-American female student. I wanted to help someone who looked like me. And 
that's why I, again, took the plunge and started it with $5,000 of my own money. But it has grown, you know, tremendously since then. I'm the type of person, I'm, I'm always looking for challenges and I like to dream big. And I came up with the idea of, you know, paying my birthdays forward. I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate and I, I recognize that. I just want to, I have everything that I need and I want to, again, help the next generation coming up behind me. And in 2018, I came up with the idea of doing like a GoFundMe type camp campaign around my birthday. And the university was gracious enough to create a fundraising page for me. And my birthday is November the 8th. And my page went live on November the 1st. And our initial target was to get to, you know, $8,000. And I think at that time when the page went live, I had about, I don't know, like $6,000 or so. Before my birthday, we'd already hit the $8,000 mark. And by December 31st of that year, you know, we got to $10,000, which enabled me to give out two awards. And I've done that, you know, every year since then. But last year was actually even more, <laughs> um, just more astronomical. Um, I, with being, being a Microsoft employee, I'm able to take advantage of the Microsoft match. And last year, um, I think I raised over $25,000 between, you know, my personal contributions and Microsoft match and, you know, friends and family donating. So I'll be able to give out five, $5,000 scholarships. That is phenomenal. And I think that story is so important for people to understand because I didn't realize um, until I talked to somebody who did very, something very similar to that um, very recently that anybody can do this. It just yes. takes a little bit of money, yeah, yeah. right? A couple thousand bucks and kind of the will to keep it going. Mm -hmm. And you can have a huge impact on a young person. Yes, yes. And I would just say, you know, that there's power in numbers. And again, you know, I just had to get creative. Like I said, I'm, I'm getting creative with how I fund it. Like I said, I make my personal contribution. I'm taking advantage of my company's matching. And a lot of companies do, you know, charitable gift matching. And again, you know, just talking to friends and family, like, if someone gives, you know, $25 here, $50 here, that, you know, that adds up. And that's how I got to, you know, rate, raising that additional, you know, $5,000 for the past, you know, two or three years. I just absolutely love that. So what's next for the Angela V. Harris Scholarship Fund? Do you have a goal for 2021? <laughs> that's a good question. I mean, obviously try, trying to take it, you know, make it bigger and bigger every year. But I'll, I'm also, also what's next is that I've since started another Angela V. Harris scholarship at my graduate alma mater LaSalle University. And I'll be giving out my first award for that scholarship this fall. Wow. That's incredible. Now, if we go to your website, AngelaVHarris.com, can we find links where we can donate and support this yes. work? Yes, awesome. absolutely. Thank oh, you. Oh, I and love actually, a happy ending. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And actually, I guess like what's next is that my very first recipient, her name is Blessing Autogame. She's a senior information systems major at Drexel University, and she, she's graduating. So I get to see my very first recipient graduate and enter the workforce. So I'm just super excited to see, you know, see how she's grown over the years and just to see where her career can go. That has to be so fulfilling to know where you were at that place in your life and what that money could have done for you. Yes. And yes. to see what it's doing for somebody else. Yes. And then and just like this, this her story, like we were such kindred spirits. I remember I met her at a, um, at an on-campus event. She was like one of the student reps for a donor event. You know, she was sharing her story. I met her when she was a sophomore and we had such similar, you know, backgrounds. She started as computer science major like myself, and she changed her major to information systems her sophomore year. And she was also passionate about, you know, supporting other women in technology. And she started an organization called the Fresh Women Cohort to have a support group for other women that were studying technology because she felt very isolated her freshman year. And, you know, she wanted to, she wanted to be a support for other women. So we are such kindred spirits and we formed a mentoring relationship and the university selects my recipient. I don't have, um, I don't, I'm not involved in that process. And fast forward about, you know, two months later, I get an email from her to say, oh my gosh, I just found out that I'm the recipient of your scholarship. And she's like, I'm so excited. And she said, you know, I don't have to worry about, you know, my tuition for this semester because, you know, basically from your award and other money that I'm getting, my, my tuition is covered so I can focus on, you know, my academics and my extracurricular activities. And she's received, you know, straight A's a few terms and she's just gone on to do like so many amazing things. She's even started her own scholarship. 
for international students. She's an international student and she started her own scholarship to support international students that she crowd she crowdfunds money for for for, for, for her students. Angela, that gives me chills, the snowball effect that you're having. I, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's just incredible. It's unbelievable. Honestly, I didn't know it would morph into me writing that $5,000 check. I didn't know that it would morph into to what it is today. So it's just unbelievable to see like how this continues to grow. Like I said, the fact that there was like over $25,000 raised last year during a, pa- during a pandemic, like that just blows me away. Yeah. And I think it speaks to this, this desire that people have to pay it forward, but we don't always know how. Yes. And you give people a way to do that that's meaningful for them, um, but also that isn't an uncomfortable level of commitment, right? Because right. you've already done the hard work. Yes. And now they can just add on. Yeah. So Angela, I just want to ask you in the time that we have left, where do you go for a sense of community? Because I would imagine that being a Black woman in technology is still pretty isolating. Yes. Um, the statistics say that, you know, Black women only make up 3% of the tech industry. And if you go back to at least like 2014 or maybe even beyond, that number has remained flat. And I would say I was very fortunate when I had that opportunity to participate in, a, in that leadership program by ITSMF. You know, that really gave me a sense of community. And it's an organization for, you know, Black professionals. And many of the members are senior senior professionals in the tech industry. And that has been a, a huge community for me. That is fantastic. What advice do you have for a young person right now looking to move into tech or get their first job in tech? I'll just share like what I tell, you know, my mentees, you know, get a mentor and, and network, you know, mentoring is, is really going to be critical in you know, navigating your career and, you know, networking as well. And I would also say just, you know, believe in yourself. You just have to believe in your, your talents and your abilities. And I feel like that's what's gotten me to where I am now. I've had so many rejections in my career, so many no's and, I just knew that I deserve better and that I was capable of doing more. No matter what people were telling me, I'm just crazy enough to believe that, you know, I can, I can change the world. I think there's a quote by Steve Jobs, those that are crazy enough to, you know, think they can change the world can. And I, I just have that belief in myself. Well, I don't doubt it for a second. <laughs> Thank you, Angela, so much for your time, for your insights and for your philanthropy. I really appreciate you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for this opportunity. Living Corporate is brought to you by The Break Room. Have you ever felt burnt out, depressed, or otherwise exhausted by being one of the onlys at work? You know what I'm talking about. Hosted by black psychologists, psychiatrists, and PhDs, The Break Room is a live weekly web show in the Living Corporate Network that discusses mental health, wellness, and healing for black folks at work. Name another weekly show explicitly focused on mental health, wellness, and healing for black folks at work. I'll wait. This is why you got to check out The Break Room, airing every Thursday at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time on livingcorporate.tv. Okay, how much fun was Angela? So what you didn't hear is that behind her, on the wall behind her, she had these printouts on the wall um, that said grind, execute, and hustle. In case you couldn't tell from the interview, this is a passionate woman who is definitely not going to sit still. If you enjoyed this episode, first of all, don't forget to go to AngelaVHarris.com and contribute to her scholarship fund. Help her pay that forward for those young women at Drexel. But also don't forget to subscribe to Living Corporate and share us with your friends and colleagues. You can also meet your favorite guests and join the conversation. This is new at C2Bchat.com. That's the letter C, the number two, the letter B, chat.com. And that's our Slack channel where you can talk to the guests and talk to um, other fans of the show. And you can really help us out by leaving us a six-star review wherever you get your podcasts. Now, maybe you're thinking, but there are only five stars, Amy. I can see the interface. Okay, give us all those stars, but then go the next step by leaving just a couple of sentences in your own words, telling us what you liked about the show or the episode. Don't forget to visit living-corporate.com to learn more about our other podcast videos, web shows, and more. See It To Be It is brought to you in part by Lead At Any Level, a certified woman and LGBT-owned business dedicated to helping organizations build inclusive cultures and diverse leadership pipelines. Lead At Any Level, leaders can be anywhere and should be everywhere. Learn more at leadatanylevel.com. That's it for this episode of See It To Be It. This is Amy C. Wanninger, and I'll see you next week.
Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.